<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this uh, three o'clock ish hour of the Boston Poetry Marathon 2022. We are we are at Heartbreak Hill right now. I can really feel it. <laughs> Just let me go on with the bad metaphors, but it's been absolutely amazing to see old faces, familiar faces, Zoom faces, um, and so on. Um, I am your MC of the hour, Christina Liu, and, um, and I'd like to thank all of you for, for being here. Um, some of you for sticking around for at least two days, if not three, on Zoom. Um, I would like to reiterate that we are holding a very important fundraiser for reproductive justice and abortion access. Um, so we have two organizations, the Fabulous Woman Project in Rhode Island and the Eastern Massachusetts Abortion Fund. Um, we carefully selected these two organizations just so the funds would really be most impactful. So give whatever you can and please spread the news. Um, you'll also see some QR codes strategically placed mm -hmm. around the venue, including in the laboratory. So be mindful, we'll find you. <laughs> okay. Um, you can also go to bostonpoetrymarathon.com and donate there. We will be holding our GoFundMe open um, until we reach and hopefully exceed our goal. All right, I'd like to remind all of our readers of the hour that, that we have seven minutes. Um, I will give you an indication when you have one minute left, i.e. when you're at the six minute mark. Um, try, if you can, to not lean into the mic like this because we're working with somewhat um, tricky Zoom technology. So this is a, a nice, nice safe distance for streaming live. All right. Our first reader of the hour is Jeff Nguyen. Um, our second reader is Jennifer G. Timothy Geiger, March Penn, Marsha Karp, Suzanne O'Toole, and Jean Benny Joaquin. All right, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jeff Nguyen. A late entry, so I hope uh, you will be patient and forgiving. Unadvisedly. After 11, they lock the basement restrooms just in case the evening needs a moment to unhinge, a wall to scratch its studded news. You hear a stiletto heel squeaking down a stairwell, but you're mistaken. It's just the sharp jawline of a stranger cricking his neck towards some vacant hallway. The catacombs beckon, beckon you to press your luck, press it until you're underfoot some classroom, someone else's leather boots, tapping out their boredom, tapping what life would be like in a different department, but the present stops you, grabs you by the collar because a gap opens between the steel teeth where a fountain stands waist deep, where a metal can once stood, purged of the usual bags of chips, coffee stained chapters, recommendations for favorite haunts, a tossed salad of applications. You are a buttoned up convulsion, awaiting an albatross of squandered promise. But in these wee hours, you settle for any mortal who's given up on finals or Russian novels, anyone to end your anguish over choosing this path you felt would make you somehow more desirable. Why else do you lunge? with the lips of your double as his ballpoint neck retracts like a prodigal shadow. And just as they seem, the rules are designed to protect. Only the fountain may touch his face. Only he may wipe his nose against your spine. 
Only he can see the lukewarm droplets sliding down your slacks, faint with sandalwood and decorum. What's left to taste is the gum-stained linoleum, the tongue of your reptile soaking up the petty wetness in your mouth. The underground only remembers your body and forgets your name, forgets your seven years reduced to bootstraps for a master who wasn't even murdered, who didn't fuck around, whose only crime was dying that afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. What a wonderful addition. I'm surprised. Um, I actually learned the word Azatrop when I was a, a youngish child um, through MIA's Many Children of the Azatrop. That was a wonderful um, image. Next up, we have Jennifer Jean. Hi. So I'm just going to read a few poems, uh, the first two from my book, Object Lessons, which <laughs> published by Lily Poetry Review Books, uh, mm -hmm. editor here, wonderful poet in person, Eileen Cleary, I'm glad that she's here, I'm glad to read from this book, it's a collection of poems that explore sex trafficking and sex trafficking survivor stories, as well as objectification in America. And the first poem I'm going to read is the title is the first line. When I taught poetry at the safe house, a kitten was lifted by the scruff by one of the safe women. She stroked and stroked and it whirred. And we read Bitch by Caroline Kaiser. And later I thought about how that stroking woman once stirred from an occupational blackout and found a poem in her scrawl. She pressed its soul into memory then burnt its remains in a Chinese bowl. The smoke whirled from thieves. She spoke the whole in class today to me and to the other sex trafficking survivors. She looked up and to the left, her tongue out at the corner, like a schoolgirl, like a lioness, and I liked it. So many of the other poems in this book explore that kind of emotional, you know, topsy turviness that went into uh, my experiences teaching poetry at the safe house. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the poems came out of that experience, but some of them came out of uh, interviews that I did and others from research that I did online, you know, in news articles and things like that. And that's where this next poem comes from. And it's also an acrostic based on the logo of uh, the Breaking Free Safe House in Minneapolis. They have this logo that's described in the poem. And the poem's called Bird. Rockwen, Godwit, Bobolink. What are we looking at? What's beaked and broken free from a classic iron bell cage with a blown out hole opposite a latched door. No thickened keratin could peck that well. No claw turned fist busted up that joint. Inside she was key. She was cheap. She was a flipped bad finger. Now this bird wings as every bird stepping out of the life with no credit, no reference and a little self love. What are we looking at? A second wind, the flight inside the creature that is the holy eternal verb is who bent the metal is the mother of a lighter bone the kind that terror cannot allow so as i said that's an acrostic and uh i've been really excited about writing acrostics for a long time like a lot of folks but I noticed most of my acrostics were about audio experiences, you know, obsessively listening to songs. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna give that type of acrostic a name. I call it a saturation. Put some of those saturations together into a new book, also published 
next, uh, by Lily Poetry Review of Books, but it'll be coming out next year. Thank you again, Eileen, for that. I'm really excited about it. The title of that book is Vos, which is Portuguese for voice. And I'm just gonna read two poems from that collection, a little preview. This is very likely the first poem in the book, but of course we'll see. <laughs> And it's based on uh, the obsession that I had was uh, with the Cold Doors disco discography, the word, you know, all of their music. So uh, it's called The Doors of Perception. My father leapt on stage at the Hollywood Bowl to grab drum and cymbal sticks from a star. He wanted to be a star, a door, a door, white. Security thugs dragged him off John Densmore he saw doors everywhere. He saw doors everywhere at the whiskey, the beanery, the Magic Mountain Fest, and in primary colors, in Windward, Oakwood, or North of Rose. He wanted to forget war in Venice, to be a door in Venice and face the faux canals. Later, he flew to Paris to pay homage to the door who died with a head of Alexandrian hair. He carried huge pale poppies to the poet's corner in the Père Lachaise, to this stranger under a cream coffin door nailed shut. He said, break on through. He put a poppy in his pocket like a receipt and chased daylight until he landed in LA, saw a wave of white stars rippling on the Pacific on new moon nights when the ever-present rough cloud was blown out to sea. He found a motel room door, part of door, and shut it on all that he owned for 50 years. He lived there adding up primary colors hour to hour in bliss consciousness, crossing his legs on the bed, letting electric snow hush the TV, hush gunfire and blood. He forgot his father's father's Cabo Verde and let himself be Italian there, a different kind of Venetian because who he really was, was too close to black. And uh, last poem I'll read is I felt empowered to read from my phone because so many people did it, so thank you. Uh, so this is um, a lot of the poems in Vos are called The Pacific. So I grew up in LA in California and this is another one of those the Pacific poems and I really wanted to read it today because I just came from the beach and my kids had told me, mom, you haven't swum, you know, you never swim. They said like, we've never seen you swim. That's not true. But they said, we've never seen you swim. So I went swimming. And I think it has been like 10 years, maybe. <laughs> they saw it 10 years ago, but yeah. So this is a gratitude poem called The Pacific. Without a boogie board, you'd fling your body into the curve of the Pacific. Without baby oil, you'd still burn and be tender for days. Without a blanket, you'd drop your faded eddy shirt, sit or lady, later shake it out and mop off the salt. Without shades, you'd razor your hand like a visor, squint at five-footers rushing up at gulls. Without money, you'd drink from a fluoridated bubbler. You'd eat that deflated PB&J, box of raisins, yellow apple. Without a comb, your hair would turn to loose dreads, damp with foam, with mist. Without shoes, your hot, callous, hobbling feet would be fleet, would crave the Pacific. Without a boombox, you'd hear other people's music. You'd walk the slanted shore till you found your song. Without some body's love, there'd be a miracle. There'd be today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. 10 years is a long time to dip oneself into the ocean. Next up, we have the wonderful Timothy Gager. Thank you. It's an honor to be invited here to read. So thank you for that and all the people's hard, hard work. I'm going to read all new stuff. So cross my fingers. Um, Nighthawks for Edward Hopper and Tom Waits. Not found on the corner jukebox, just like her hand is unplayable when reached for tonight, the way he's reached for it forever. The waiter is the cook, is the host, the coffee maker, the bill collector, chasing the man right now for an order, while she's been caught in an indifferent evening out, now a stalled conversation. The man asks, what do you want? 
as an uncomfortable stranger at the counter becomes worth his weight avoiding eye contact. But no one can answer any question because they're not about the pie, which is too easy baked today. Cherry or apple, blueberry is yesterday. She no longer likes blueberry or the diner no longer feels open forever. Um, I, I watched a lot of bad movies during the pandemic. So I ran out of things to watch. So this is a poem about a horrible movie called Fathers and Daughters. And if you're planning on watching it, spoiler alert. I am alone watching bad movies during the pandemic. <laughs> a little girl can't be nicknamed Potato Chip, then as a grown woman still be called Potato Chip. And a man can't start a seizure, hold it off, walk to the bathroom, then flop involuntarily. Seizures do not work that way. For that matter, neither does getting psychologically institutionalized for seizure disorders to seven months. And upon returning for young daughter, Potato Chip, brother and sister-in-law suggest keeping her because they really love her. And epilepsy equals incompetence. Plus, their boys and Potato Chip get along really great, which leads to future, future pushing and father punching brother-in-law, who is, by the way, a lawyer, now presenting a custody suit, which doesn't matter. He had an affair. His secretary is now pregnant. Also, moot point, because father dies seizing on the bathroom floor. Meanwhile, we never found out if Potato Chip was brought up by the sister-in-law. But now, grown-up Potato Chip has meaningless, unfeeling sex all over New York City until she meets Aaron Paul who I wrestled with not being Jesse Pinkman or Todd from Bojack, who read the father's book, Fathers and Daughters, then calls her potato chip also. He loves her and she loves him, but she just can't and has meaningless sex without feeling with one more guy. And Aaron Paul expected much more because potato chip is a working therapist now who helped a traumatized girl to speak again. If only my damn living room could talk, it would tell me there is no possible way potato chip can jog to Jesse or Todd, whomever's house sometime in daylight, but arrive way after dark. And of course, he is with a woman. So she literally runs back home, losing the long crying marathon. Ah, lo and behold, Jesse or Todd had a car beating her already parked outside her house. They hug the end. <laughs> the people of Star Island. They are like barn swallows circling the area and ground between the porch and the dock, crisscrossing in figure eights joining each other in their oval, then dropping off, only to have another fall into the open slot. It's what we see from the porch. These events happen, circle us, and we circle, even sitting at tables or rocking chairs. Someone will fly off, and then a new energy, a new person will enter into the pattern, bird in, bird out. We are the swallows, circling, admiring, admiring. Political climate. Close the door, difficult when swollen. Paint forced off wood, catches, then slams louder than intended. Intolerable to stay cool when the mercury rages, angry in a state of red. There once was a harvest. Red pickup sat in the track of dried mud. In desolation, death left you alone, rust around the body and bed, tired dirt sprayed on its rubber, parked near our barn, once glossed in a thick corona blue, now distressed, peeling, the color fights a battle with the barn board. A piece of fabric blows through the hacked out yard. The man with side cut hair pitches his gaze up to miles around miles in all around direction. The sun singed corn stands at attention, straight and stiff. The kernels burned and dry, husks wave slightly, offering nothing to him. Reversing the rain. When reversing the rain, the sky is closing, the desert soaking, empty hearts lie in cavities, emptied into hands, left with just hooks, sought with fingers, detached with fullness. Some assembly required the lengthy daylight, the taking of theirs, the losing 
being of yours. We collected lost stamps, knowing nothing of Costa Rica, nothing of New Guinea, no expert on geography, an expert on the oceanic, the fish emptied the oceans, the whales washed away to sea, serenity washed over, rolled over anger, left on the shore, then tossed in the crest. The tossed boat tried to dock, pick up a wounded animal, which will not be rescued. Uh, last one, can I fly you a drink? Is the poem found from an internet article with internet comments. A wax wing eats a berry from an arrowwood tree. Birds are known to forge on fermented fruit. Life lately in tiny Gilbert, Minnesota resembles a scene out of a Hitchcock movie. The residents call 911. Rowdy birds fly into windows and cars act confused. Cops conclude the unruly birds are not out for blood. They just had too many. And having a boozy lark is nothing abnormal in the feathered set. But a line between tipsy or fall down drunk is picked out correctly every now and then. With no need to call emergency services to report inebriated avions, they'll sober up shortly. No crime in flying home with someone you normally wouldn't nest with, just shame. Police should be summoned <laughs> if citizens see Woodstock pushing Snoopy off his doghouse, Big Bird opening a, operating a motor vehicle in an unsafe manner, and other birds after midnight with Taco Bell items. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just picturing birds um, going through the drive through at Taco Bell right now. This is very surreal, very wonderful. <laughs> Next up, we have March 10th. This is a tradition I look forward to every year. Um, and my first poem is somewhat timely. This starts September 1st. 2019. Beep, beep, beep. Another moving truck backs up. Curbside ceramic cups clank in soiled cardboard, asking the day where the night went. The stress of abandonment and new beginnings, becoming interchangeable sofas on sidewalks for miles down Com Ave. September 1st, an explosion that I mistake for a building collapse. My friend ventures out to get groceries and returns with an answer. Oh, a moving truck crashed into the fire escape. Oh, 10 years earlier, September 1st, 2009. My mom and I wake up at dawn to go park the moving truck and my mom screams when she sees a line of eight moving trucks all in the front of the building. How could there be so many trucks already? Is the moving truck an unsinkable ship? The GPS directs us down a car's only road. The warning sign for trucks dangling like a jewel on the necklace of the city. The truck crashes into the sign and sparks fly off the roof. We're stuck on Storrow Drive. I don't even know yet the accident is a cliche. We're not allowed to return the moving truck to the nearby lot because it's full. We drive much farther away instead. We have never experienced a rotary before. Isn't the plot to fail? And that's how her anxiety attack becomes inseparable from mine. And suddenly I haven't been born yet. I'm a fetus in the city of Alston. That's kind of an origin story in a way, at least how I ended up here my first day. Um, another origin is that Suzanne O'Toole is a poet who will be coming up later. Um, she and I started an organization called the Self-Educating Poets Network. You can find us on Facebook, DIY MFA, or selfeducatingpoetsnetwork.org. Um, we have free literary events, workshops, and publishing opportunities. And the next poem that I'm going to read mentions that effort. Always. We couldn't afford an MFA, so we started a school for poets, completely free and grassroots. We couldn't find a swimming pool that summer, so we swam in a lake deep in the woods, near where you have lived for decades, but now with the intensity of someone nature deprived. It's absurd. How can we always be nature ourselves and be nature deprived? But of course, Zoom dates only go so far. The net of freshwater plants tickling our heels and backs as we swam out to Seagull Island, 
We joked more like bird poop island as we swam back tickles again until we could stand up badly with jagged rocks cramping our tender feet. Dimensions of kissing. In the mirror, my face looks like melted butter and my voice has lost its lavender. This is chronic pain on a weekday evening. Trigeminal neuralgia, the suicide disease, or not just pain, as one doctor said dismissively, like diagnosis is some kind of golden egg only a few ever find. Sometimes my mouth kisses another and the distance between my longing and my physical being widens into a second mouth that kisses her back and back. Pleasure is hope that lingers, wanting to press the flowers into bookmarks, returning to the page, any day in bloom. All right. And I have one that's, I'm trying to write poems about Boston. So this is about the Boston cream donut. I can't even eat donuts, so I don't know. what am I doing? Okay. Boston cream. What if the subconscious is the cream in the donut? We're not uncovering truth, but we're eating desire and stumble upon an unexpected structure, which is only unexpected because nobody spoke of the innards. And there are folks who say, don't get a stomach ache. There are boxes and boxes. Just prefacing this, I do like pets, animals, dogs very much, but some people use them in ways that are troublesome. How am I doing on time? You've got exactly two Perfect. All right, great. This dude comes into the tennis court with his huge out of control off leash dog, which lunges at me aggressively as I book it out of there on rollerblades. The next day I return to the tennis court relieved that two tennis players are there, but they keep getting grossed out. Ooh, another pile of shit, watch out. I realized not only did the dude encourage his aggressive dog to take up all the space and make me feel unsafe, he also didn't pick up after the dog. Why do some people treat a dog like a gun, a tool wielded to control and take over? Why is that the way to relate? What about being like a guinea pig confused by the moving landscape of my body? What if all the insects were as big and loud as helicopters? What if they kept landing everywhere, freaking everyone out? What if the tools weren't our tools at all? What if we all were made of grass and marmalade what if guns didn't exist? What if war was abolished? All right, I don't know. I don't think I have time for the next one. So I will stop it there. Thank you. Thank you for the question. The germination of your thoughts. Next up, we have Marshall Park. Thank you so much, and especially um, thank you to uh, Suzanne Mercury, who's been very um, welcoming to me and grateful. Irata Tum. I knew a drummer when I was a girl, and he was a man who told me his rat-a-tat-tat. They'd never had anything like me, he said, and snared, not from love, but from art among their beaten men. Though we kissed after hot dogs and tasted of mustard, his rolls and his flams and his tatted tattoos never sounded between us. The man from, the girl from one side, the man from the other of town. He's still a man if still he is. I'm now a woman in grief for her art. My tittle, my jaw have been scraped from my song. They are mine and are perfect. Stolen, my leash sheep, my grace notes, my ruffles. I've always remembered that man from our vinegar kiss 
and his report, not the first, but the first I'd heard as he brushed by in kindness my life of unmuffled madness from art, that if I dare master the Radom McHugh might be mine. Not the world, but some part of it. When I scoured for love, some part of the world for arms to launch myself into, I kept my raid to myself or blabbed without cease, mongrel me, who could feel here is one whom after I'll run and never did know which me might be me the next moment. You, love of my life, have we met and where and when? Was that you with the blue eyes and blonde who'd left women aside? Or you who, fat old baldy, still cried after a talk with a mother still cruel, then turned your venom on me? You with whom I tended the mad? Or you? more orphan, more surely yourself than me. I never have soured on love, the new lost grown out of. There is world yet and time yet enough. From the oral tradition. It's not couth, it's not kind, your complaint, and it's this'll kill you, not clever. It came as a proverb you wrote in the hope of what? That next time I'd swallow your line, hook and sinker, and stomach your spilt oh, milk. She. She'd been saying it for so long and with passion too, that there was a person inside every body, that every person was as surely the world as every other person was. But when she lost any place she'd had in the world, she knew it for sure. And since she'd always been able to put to the side herself, the sureness seeking to find its level of change, found a ground long seeded with shame and flooded into flourishing such a harvest of behind the scenes peerings that she knew herself only desire clothed in legend and cunning and in will and in endless supply. And she did her worst on herself by doing her best to keep mum that she was. They are not us, nor we them. As if we haven't wanted for ourselves their special gifts, as if defiance were not in their falls. They walk off branches, on, then off, upon, then boom, they drop, then walk upon our ground. They laugh, cheap, cheap, at our green eyes, as if a magic hand sluiced round and touched each one of them, a touch, please, please, we each one aimed at us. They up, we'll gather, fly, bye-bye from us who lumber in our jealous flight machines. Then some of us are providence and some boom of us provender. What is left? We think it is new. We are so, so afraid. We think there has never been, ever been a thing like our thing. So we are so afraid. Just think. A village rapes a girl, a village burns a man. Here is the maelstrom, here is the horror. People we like are like people we don't. 
It is our turn to live it and not know what hit us. It is our turn for mayhem that droppeth as rain. It is our turn to cry we are virtue's last bastion, while mayhem and help us turn us into them. She is 12 and they rape that girl over and over. That collar of tire, which then becomes fire, is fitted by many hands to one neck. Nobody taught us. We know how to do it. We shout and we leap for our lives to some standing. It is you. No, not I. Yes. And no, no, no. Help us. We say that that thing is loosed from another town over. Oh, tut, tut. Just think. It is ours and is us. What is left for our thing when havocs and swing all against all first among none? Thank you. Marcia, thank you. That was haunting and horrible. So powerful. Next up, we have Suzanne O'Toole. Thank you Thanks for having me here. Um, I'll begin with a haiku called Reunion. Eyes open, smile cracks, discovering you're still here. All my heart at once. All right. This is a little bit of a longer piece. It's called The Long Flight Home. In eighth grade, we had this plan to build a two-person bicycle-powered flying machine that would fly to prom. We wanted to assemble it using a rector set, scrap metal, a few pieces of pipe, lonely lengths of rope, just a bunch of junk lying in the cellars of our homes. We might have included a small supplemental engine of some sort. We hadn't really nailed down the details, but that wasn't important. It was all about the vision. We had it mostly planned out. In between our side-by-side -side tandem bike, I had always figured we'd have space for a cup holder or a console of some sort, someplace to pull the ripcord or lift the lever that would allow us to sail off into the sky. Sure, we never ironed out the entire plan. Prom snuck up on us too soon, and by then years would have passed and we'd have different dates, but I had considered the curves of the handlebar and our site of departure. We'd unload our Da Vinci-inspired contraption from someone's car, even though we never figured out whose. But we were going to fly it using our feet. We were going to pedal it as fast as we could on a runway built out of our junior, senior high school's uh, student parking lot, where all present would have witnessed a miracle. Within the space of maybe a football field, probably less, our machine was going to thread itself through the fabric of the sky, uh, where we would wave at our classmates below. The two of us, silly science geeks, actually piloting a ship of our own invention in what would have been the nerdiest prom of our wildest dreams. The two of us, more fantasy than fact, the two of us used to living in that kind of world, one of our own making, one that no one else could shape. Reality wasn't quite as much fun. Your mom wound up driving us to our freshman year down. The internet was still in its infancy back then. Even searching for a solution would have been pointless. Probably wouldn't even have been able to find the right wrenches we would have needed anyway, or the right bolts for the collapsing parts, the pieces that would telescope, the kite kit that we would have turned into a special sail of sorts, just what we needed to capture the wind. The gears, specific gears that would have converted pedal forward plus air into flight upwards. I saw an advertisement once saying you could send away for the parts of a small single passenger plane and know it wasn't our machine. But yes, it did remind me of us. Whenever I see other bike-powered flight events, I always think of you. Old friend, those days are gone. Our machine only ever existed in our minds. I wonder what you do with yours. On occasion, I shine mine up, put a little oil around the collapsing parts, a little grease where the telescoping pieces go. I'm amazed I can still lift it myself, but you know what? I've never piloted it alone. Even in my dreams, when I take it out for a whirl, you're always there with me, sailing off into our geeky little universe like Amelia's last great flight, not just to the silly dance, although we did make an appearance there once, landing in the parking lot where our, all our classmates erupted with the congratulatory cheers we'd always hoped for as we exited our tinker toy plane built for two. Even the football players clapped you on the shoulder, remarked how cool it was, and asked, how long did it take you guys to build? You looked at me as you replied, what did it take us, a couple of months? I nodded and said, mostly three weekends of tightening down the bolts, but it really didn't seem like long at all, almost felt like it fell to the earth out of the sky of our minds. 
So weird how we both share that same fantasy. The parking lot takeoff and landing, strolling in wearing, wearing fancy clothing worthy of the ride, let alone the occasion. But nowadays, whenever I fly with you, ever my co-pilot, I just see us flying over land and sea, waving the well-wishers below, amazed at how the air doesn't bother us, how I'm never chilled at this height, even though we don't have windows. And I've always attributed that to your magic. But lately, at the end of every make-believe flight, it always feels the same, ends the same. We're calmly pedaling together. You turn toward me. I see your face, and we both smile. You ask me where to, the way you always used to when you pick me up with your car. But this time, I don't answer north, south, east, or west. This time, I just smile at you when the sun sets, and the birds keep pace, and our legs never cramp. And I just turn and say, up, 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 up. <laughs> I have a few more page-oriented pieces. <laughs> that one's a little bit more of a spoken word piece. Um, all right. I have, um, when I was a green parrot. When I was a green parrot chirpy at the clay lick, twas but a lifetime ago. When I was a chatty one, a convivial, a happy one, a silly sally sappy one. Oh. When I was a green parrot, all cheerfully unbroken, so free to speak, outspoken, so... When I was a green parrot, a chirpy, quirky, chappy one, before I met a zappy one, whoa. When I was a green parrot, a chirpy at the clay lick, it was but a lifetime ago. This one is called Miss Havisham Sees Him One Last Time. I hope that you find that time has worked some wonder on you. Jagged <laughs> bottle softened into sea glass. Attic paper stitched into silverfish lists. I've been waiting all this time, the way I said I would, the way the good are supposed to, the way the Lord would have it. But then again, the Lord left long ago. I believe he had your face. <laughs> I have two more. Do I have time to think of this? Okay, perfect. All right. This one is another uh, literary piece. Just called The Private Life of Mad Hatter. Mad Hatter may sport a smoking jacket to protect his waistcoat and watch, may meet you neath sprigs of mistletoe carrying bouquets of hollyhock. Mad Hatter may sip the finest tea till it pours out both of his ears. He'll pester you with foolish jokes collecting your stitches in tears. Mad Hatter may draw very well or leave little but lines on a page. Mad Hatter may belong elsewhere on a soapbox, a platform, a stage. Mad Hatter may mean well, but simply knows not what to say. Opportunity tends to slip by while watching his time pass away. Mad Hatter may tell you he loves you. He might also forget what to say, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't. That's just the Mad Hatter's way. And the last piece is called There Was a Time. There was a time when I was disturbed by time, by the distance between dates, when I lamented the ink spilt not in your praise. There was a time when I was flustered by time, by the way it ticked so slowly and we talked so quickly and I lamented the way we floated away more vapor than smoke. But there was a time, a time that I relish like good strawberry jam, a time that I preserve, a time when I held you or did you hold me? There was a time when we stood on solid ground, not too far from the sea. Thank you. So far, I'd like to introduce our last reader of this hour, John Sunny Watson. Thank you very much. Thank you. I usually write a new poem for this occasion, but today I don't have a new poem. I read two old poems, but they are my favorite. They are amongst my favorite. The first one is for a friend called. Jose de Santos, a dear friend. The poem is called The White Shirt. The White Shirt. It's me. I am the poet's white shirt. I have perhaps lost buttons. My collar stretches around the neck. My long sleeves cover the artist's 
arms. It's me, the white one, he chooses always. Not the blue he wears to work. Not the red for protest days. He puts me on and takes me always on special occasions, no matter the season. I am the poet's favorite. I am the white shirt. I shine in the crowd to light his eyes and I take the stains. And the next one is called the poem, le poem. I will read it in translation. It's a poem I always dream to write, something that feels like a song you can take anywhere, something that people will dance to. So I will read it. Let me read it first, first in the language I wrote it, then in English, and then in my native language, Haitian Creole, to honor the language I learned to write. Le poem. Pour le dernier poème, je veux qu'on me prenne par la main, mais vite sur scène et surtout sans aucun applaudissement. Je veux qu'on m'accueille comme si je revenais d'un long voyage pour quérir le poème de la paix. Que la foule danse le poème, que ces mots soient musique et illuminent toute la salle. Que le poème rentre aussi dans la danse comme dans un jeu de ronde où les pieds s'entremêlent et sautillent à la folie pendant que les mots pétillent joie et bonheur. Ainsi, je fermerai les yeux pour m'installer au plus profond de moi, me perdre dans l'ambiance et devenir mémoire du poème. Le poème. For the last poem, I want someone to take me by the end, invite me on stage, and above all, without any applause. I want someone to greet me as if I had returned from a long trip in search of the poem of peace. I want the crowd to dance the poem, that its words be music and illuminate the entire hall, that the poem itself may join the dance like a circle game in which everyone's feet intermingle and leap madly until the words glitter with joy and goodwill. Then I will shut my eyes to find my deepest self vanish into the atmosphere and become the memory of the poem. And now allow me to read it in my native language for that language, in Haitian Creole. Poem na. Ndaye me ou pran mem pou denye poem na, evite monte sen, me fok patage ou ken aplodisman. Mwen vle pou yo rese vwam, tan kou mte sot fe yon gwo voyaj, pou mka jwen poem la pe ya. Fok tout, fok tout fou la dan se poem na. Fok mwen yo toune mizik, en pi tou, pour y éclairer toute salle. C'est pour pour un entraînant dans ce tout, tant qu'on joue de faire one, côté tout pied au fait mêler mélo, à voltiger sans plein souffle, pendant tout moyo fait dian dian bonnet à la joie. Comme ça, on va le faire mes gym pour montrer bien fond dans moi-même, petite tête moi, non bien ça, pour me venir tourner mes moi pour elle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And I, I felt like it was just so All right. Um, thank you. Um, we have a last hour coming up, and shall I read the mm -hmm. reports? Uh, Carmelita, Carmelita Shandlin, Jasper Yura, Matt Heinig, Lou Nguyen, and Jean Jordan is listed <laughs> somewhere. And that's it. How long shall we break for? Very short break.